Well, thank you very much, Andrew. I'm very honored to be here in this really splendid place. This looks a lot like my apartment here in Washington. Um, you know, the high ceiling, the decorative uh, wall work and so forth uh, makes me feel at home. Uh, and uh, it's a real honor to be asked by the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati uh, to discuss my little book. Uh, just for the sake of the audience here and so forth, I'll, I'll show up, I'll be shamelessly plugging my book here, showing you a copy, Mental Maps of the Founders, How Geographic Imagination Guided American's Revolutionary Leaders. And it's, it's, uh, it's not a formidable book, it's a series of six essays with an introduction, and certain amount of conclusion, uh, but I'm here to discuss it and I do so with a certain humility. Uh, I am not a professional historian. I not get a PhD. Uh, uh, like so many people in Washington, I went to law school because, you know, what else can you do? Uh, but uh, I have, nor have I conducted a extensive archival research. And I'm told here at Anderson House, we have a very substantial map library, which I should have consulted and didn't. But I'm a journalist and a political writer. Uh, and I've written over the years, or perhaps I should say I have processed a few million words about American politics, uh, speckled with historical references and anecdotes. And like so many Americans, I've been a grateful reader of the excellent books on the American Revolution and the early Republic produced in recent decades by both academic scholars and by non-academic writers. Uh, which has been showcased in, some of which has been showcased in movies and on the Broadway stage uh, with complete with rap music cadence and so forth. Uh, it has captivated many readers uh, and people in many uh, media uh, and so forth. And during the COVID epidemic, I decided I wanted to learn more about it, more about the founding, more about the uh, about the founders uh, who created this country and who nurtured it through its earliest years. Um, some years ago, my friend, the great reporter and Reagan biographer, Lou Cannon told me, if you really want to learn about a subject, write a book about it. So when I thought, I, I, when I started working on the founders, I thought of uh, about what could I contribute to the literature about the founders? Uh, and I thought of my lifetime interest in maps. Uh, I grew up in Northwest Detroit in one of those square mile grids, the streets uh, that uh, just, uh, just half a mile south of the not as yet fabled eight mile. I don't know how many of you have seen the eight mile movie. Uh, and uh, we were at seven and a half mile. Uh, and uh, it was part of the six square mile by six square mile township plans originated by Thomas Jefferson when he was a member of the uh, Confederation Congress in the 1780s uh, and which you travelers can observe today uh, from airplane windows on clear days if you flying from western Pennsylvania to the to Orange County California you can see Jefferson's grids laid out uh, down below you across the continent that Jefferson himself uh, never traveled across, but always imagined. Um, and uh, the, the first little bit of research I did uh, convinced me that the founders did not have accurate maps. Actually, in the American Revolution, as Andrew Outen has confirmed to me, it was the British who had the best maps uh, of the territory, and the, the found American revolutionaries uh, had to make do with lesser maps, and fortunately, they had a guy uh, as commander in chief who had had some experience as a surveyor uh, who was able to contribute some good sense of the land and how you how you deal with different landscapes. Um, but the maps the, the maps that existed then did not go much beyond the Atlantic coastline. Uh, and a little reflection on this told me that they had no clear idea of what would be the boundaries of the new nation whose independence they proclaimed. Uh, we all have mental maps. We all carry within our heads uh, mental maps of the places that are or which we hope will become familiar. Uh, you know the way to the shopping mall and which exit you should take from the freeway. 
uh, you know which way to walk in your neighborhood when you're walking the dog and how, how to find your way home uh, and so forth. Uh, for some of those, for some of us, those maps are detailed and precise, uh, and I plead guilty to being one of those people. For others, there's no more than lines that pop up on our GPS devices. And I have to say a word that as a person who's tried doing some political reporting over the years, and going to places of uh, great importance like Iowa and New Hampshire, uh, I'm a little irritated by the GPS because it hurts my comparative advantage. I have a pretty good sense of how you get to Manchester Airport and where you park in downtown Manchester to go to the hotel that you're going to and so forth. But uh, the GPS tells all my competitors the same thing. So I don't have an advantage over them anymore. Uh, but what were the founders maps like? So I set myself to do more reading and to visit some of the terrain and the homes of the founders themselves to try to answer that question. And the result is this book of six essays on the map, mental maps of six of the founding fathers. Uh, tonight, I want to offer some reflections on those essays and on the founders generally. And in Plutarchian fashion, I will offer you portraits of three pairs of my six founders, starting with what each pair had in common and then spiraling out to describe which, uh, what made each distinctive. And the first pair is Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin and George Washington. They were the oldest of our, my six founders. Franklin was born in 1706 and retired from his business enterprises at age 42 in 1748. When Washington was still a teenager, uh, Franklin was already one of the richer men in the colonies. He was, uh, of course, always liked to portray himself as kind of a simple printer and stuff. Uh, he was a smart businessman who invented a number of things like franchising his printing operation and creating the matching grant to uh, subsidize or to f uh, finance uh, philosophical societies, libraries, and other community organizations. Um, both Franklin and Washington spent much of their adult lives as faithful servants of the British crown. Franklin spent almost all of the two decades from 1755 to 1775 in London. Uh, he was internationally famous for his discoveries about electricity, uh, while the young Washington yearned for the English education and a commission in the Royal Navy, which his older half-brother Lawrence had uh, in, uh, in, instead uh, was never given a position in the British uh, military forces that he sought. Um, but he nonetheless fired what the British uh, son of Prime Minister and memoirist Horace Walpole called the volley in the backwoods that set the world on fire. That volley was shot in what is now Western Pennsylvania in the middle 1750s and started what became a world war fought in India and Europe as well as North America, a world war between Britain and France. And at just about the same time, Benjamin Franklin, based in Philadelphia, started urging that the British colonists think of the seaboard colonies as a single unit. Uh, so far as I can tell, this was an innovation. Uh, the colonies, uh, it, it went against the grain. Colonies had been formed at different times for different proprietors with different charters. Uh, and in particular, uh, by different religious groups. Uh, this was consequential to those familiar with history because the history of the previous century, the 17th century, was a history of political, of, of warfare that was basically over religion, not just in Western Europe and Central Europe generally, but also in the British Isles. Uh, and so this was the background. Uh, so the colonies had a lot not necessarily in common. Um, you know, the, 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 the New England colonies were founded by Calvinists, Virginia and the Carolinas by Anglicans, Pennsylvania by Quakers, Maryland by Catholics, and, the, uh, and New York by those very stubborn and difficult people, Dutch reformers. Uh, the New England merchants of Bernard Balin described of the 17th century didn't think they had much in common with the South Carolina 
philosophers who envisage their colony as a second Barbados, a slave colony producing uh, sugar and other commodities for, for Britain. Uh, Benjamin Franklin thought the English speaking residents of the colonies did have something in common. He was born in insular Boston, uh, ex escaped uh, from there, went to Philadelphia as a teenager, uh, the, the 15th of 17 children, by the way. Uh, he was exposed in the 1720s to gigantic London and its great literature. He became a hugely successful printer based in Philadelphia who sold his Poor Richard's Almanacs uh, up and down the colonies, not just in locally in Philadelphia, but throughout there. He set up and bankrolled other printers, basically setting up franchises in the different colonies and even in one of the West Indian sugar colonies. Uh, he sponsored the evangelist George Whitefield's revival meetings. This is what's referred to as the first great awakening in the 1740s. And Franklin, not a particularly religious man himself, or at least not one who portrayed himself as such, became a good friend with Whitefield uh, and uh, it helped to arrange his meetings up and down the, the Atlantic coast while building a giant auditorium that was big enough for his crowds in Philadelphia. Uh, so uh, people today speak of the United States as a nation that suddenly in some recent decade suddenly became culturally diverse. We were all just a white bread uh, country that was uh, culturally unified, not diverse. Um, this is a misreading of history in my view. These colonies were device, diverse all along, founded as I said, by people with different religions, uh, with different cultural found uh, folkways. Uh, I suspect many of the people listening here in the hall and of listening have read uh, or perused uh, David Hackett Fisher's wonderful book, Albion Seed, uh, about four British folkways and four regions of the colonies. Uh, he's followed that up with a sequel about the African Americans who were brought here as slaves and their different folkways. He doesn't handle it. He actually makes a point of mentioning it in the foreword to Albion Seed, which was published way back in 1989, uh, that he doesn't undertake the most difficult of the uh, folk ways to interpret that of New York City. Uh, it's, uh, but it's he makes the point it's clearly different from all the rest uh, and uh, with that so forth. Um, Franklin thought of the colonies as a unit, and this was an innovation. In a pamphlet written in 1751, uh, not publicized till later, Franklin noticed that the colony's populations were, were doubling every two decades. Uh, he was a man who always noticed things. He noticed the, the Gulf Stream current on his uh, transatlantic voyages, dipped thermometers in the water, measured it, kept track of the measurements. He, he was very curious, learned about everything. And he prophesied in that pamphlet accurately that the greater number of Englishmen will be on this side of the water in 100 years. And they were, if you mean English-speaking uh, people who uh, descended from those colonists and others who came here. In 1754, at a conference with the Iroquois uh, chiefs in Albany, New York, which was designed to make sure the Iroquois were allies of the British against the French forces that were trying to penetrate the interior of North America and take effective control of what is now Western New York, Western Pennsylvania. Uh, he sought agreement unsuccessfully from leaders of the other colonies on an Albany plan of union to oppose the French advances in the Ohio River Valley and to persuade them. Franklin ran the first colonial political cartoon showing a snake sliced into multiple segments, each one labeled with each colony's abbreviation and a caption, unite or die. Um, this was a new element. Uh, Franklin was aware as he did this, that the Virginia House of Burgesses in 1753 and 1754 had dispatched a young landowner with experience as a surveyor to go west of the Blue Ridge to tell the French not to advance on the forks of the Ohio, the junction of the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers where it forms the Ohio River at the site that would become Pittsburgh. That young landowner, just 21 years old in 1753, was George Washington, 
Uh, why was Washington chosen? Well, he was chosen because of the experience he had gained since age 17 as a surveyor for Lord Fairfax, proprietor of an enormous land grant, all the land between the Rappahannock and Potomac rivers, west from Chesapeake Bay to the river's sources somewhere in the Appalachian Mountains. Nobody originally knew where that was. Uh, this grant was of uncertain validity. It had originally been issued by uh, King Charles II at a time when in the year 1649, after his father had been beheaded and Charles II was in exile on the lamb from Cromwell's forces in England. In other words, Charles probably sold this to somebody uh, for rights that he had no effective ability to transmit at that time. Uh, Lord Fairfax um, litigated uh, the the, the various uh, through various sources, the ownership of the grant fell in on Lord Fairfax, uh, and it was uh, he litigated in the Privy Council uh, for eleven years from 1732 to 1743, and soon after winning his case in London, he brought it there because he thought the Virginia House of Burgesses would rule against him. Uh, he he moved to Virginia himself. Uh, he had been sort of astonished that the uh, man that he had hired as manager of his lands there, a man named Robert, known as Robert King Carter, a big landowner in North in Virginia, had died with 10,000 pounds in uh, cash money, in gold money, on his premises, uh, which would have made him a rich man in England to have a country estate, a house in London, a seat in Parliament. Uh, and uh, Lord Fairfax decided that he wanted to make that money himself, and the way to do so was to live in North America on the grant himself, uh, where the unmarried peer blessed the marriage of his grandniece, uh, Anne Fairfax, to Lawrence Washington, uh, what George's older half-brother. Um, and that lease came down. They, uh, George uh, Lawrence eventually died of uh, consumption, uh, Washington had gone to Barbados with him uh, to try and result, and he he left uh, his wife, who later died herself, uh, to uh, uh, in, well, in in control of a property of a small house that he named after his commanding admiral in the Royal Navy, Commander Ad, or Edward Byrne. Uh, you can visit the remains of that house today, not too far from here. Um, and um, it was it, it, his his wife also died, and George Washington then got ownership of the land. So her name, by the way, at the time of her death, had a wonderful Northern Virginia name, Anne Fairfax Washington Lee. Uh, George Washington's unsuccessful attempts to warn off the French from the Ohio country took him northwest of the land he rented from. Lawrence's widow, along the Potomac River, over the mountains. He went up within 15 miles of Lake Erie. That's a long drive today uh, in October and November in the cold weather season. That would be a really long trip. Uh, the land whose contours were only vaguely described in the latest available map, which had been drawn in 1752 by two landowners who were surveyors named Joshua Fry and Peter Jefferson. Peter Jefferson was the father of Thomas Jefferson uh, and one of the people that drew this map. A year later, Washington was appointed second in command to the British General Edward Braddock, who spurned his advice to adopt Indian tactics and was ambushed and killed on the banks of the Monongahela. Uh, Washington retreated over the already familiar ground, and for the rest of his life, he came to see the Potomac as the highway penetrating the Allegheny Ridges, connecting, he hoped, only over a few hills uh, to the Monongahela and the Ohio, uh, in whose valley he ultimately bought thousands of acres and where he noticed the presence of a particularly valuable variety of coal, an omen of the Industrial Revolution of the next century. So he is foreseeing something like paving the way from Washington to Pittsburgh. Uh, to what becomes the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, which he uh, also prosecuted, and also uh, the National Road, which passes through much of that territory, and you can go on some segments of that today, and so forth. 
that was Washington's mental map always focused on this route, north by northwest. Uh, Washington's military experience, uncommon in the colonies, led to his unanimous selection at the Second Continental Congress as commander of the Continental Army. Uh, it also helped that he wore the uniform of the Fairfax County um, Board of Militia, uh, buff and blue, which are the colors of George Washington University today, uh, to the meetings of the Continental Congress. His ability to learn from mistakes and militarily assess terrain helped keep his makeshift and often unpaid army together, and his mental map kept him focused on regaining New York, the British and loyals a stronghold which he saw as necessary to unite uh, irreversibly anti-British New England. New England was basically lost to the British. Uh, they abandoned it in 1776. Uh, with revolution supporting Pennsylvania and Virginia. Without New York, they would not have a geographically united nation. And he's constantly buzzing around. You look where his winter camps were, in Morris County, New Jersey, Valley Forge, when the British went to Philadelphia, along the Hudson River. He goes to conferences in Connecticut. He's circling around New York. Um, and he... Uh, he's only with difficulty that he's persuaded to go down to Yorktown in Virginia because the French commander Rochambeau convinces him that this time the French Navy really is going to come and provide assistance uh, in Chesapeake Bay, and they do. Uh, but um, and um, Washington, he, he was relatively less interested in countering the British really uh, savage and aggressive warfare in the Carolinas and Georgia in 1780 and 1781. And during the war and his tours, as ceremonial tours as president, he found the economic energy and civic equality of the Northern states congenial and the society of the slave majority Carolina and Georgia coast unappealing, just as he found Barbados unappealing with its slave majority. Uh, quietly and after lengthy consideration, just as he decided to resign his military command in 1783, and just as he decided Cincinnatus like not to seek a third term as president in 1796, Washington turned against slavery. And in the last year of his life, he sat down and personally wrote out his quill pen, a will freeing his and his wife's slaves. He was consciously setting precedents which he hoped would guide the leaders and the people of the Republic which he more than anyone else created. Washington's mental map linked the capital he situated on the Potomac with the route inland, north by northwest to what would become the industrial heartland, which powered the Union to victory in the Civil War in the 19th century and performed as the arsenal and democracy in the world wars of the 20th century. That was Washington's contribution. It's a measure of Washington's steely self-confidence that he could appreciate the talents and appoint as cabinet members two men as brilliant and as different in temperament and geographic orientation in their mental maps as Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. In his writings, at one point, Hamilton describes British Canada as being on our left and Spanish, uh, Spanish America the southern colonies on our right, an observation which makes sense only if you're standing there looking out over the Atlantic Ocean, uh, trying to make and trying to make out those indivis invisible lines of trade routes across the ocean, linking the ports which were the Western world's leading centers of commerce and industry. And in his writings uh, to Robert Morris, in his writings. At the time of the revolution, he talks about the Hanseatic ports of Hamburg and Bremen, of Amsterdam, uh, the trading cities uh, of, uh, of, of uh, city states of, of, of Italy and so forth. Those are his models. They're connected by those invisible lines going out over the water. Um, and it's, it's the experience that he gained as a, as a young man in St. Croix, where he grew up in such miserable circumstances, uh, abandoned by the father, the mother dies, the uh, guardian commits suicide. At age 17, the owners of the uh, merchant firm where he's a clerk say, well, we got to go on medical leave, you run the place. 
and he collects debts that they weren't able to collect, tells captains to go to different ports and so forth, conducts currency negotiations through three or four different currencies, uh, and uh, figures out the, uh, the, the economics of this place at age 17. I mean, we're dealing with a prodigy here that reminds me of his contemporary, almost exact contemporary, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart in music. Uh, Jefferson's geographic orientation was almost the exact opposite. The only book this brilliant writer, amazing, just read his, the gift that he had for phrases. The, the only book he ever wrote, Notes on Virginia, begins with a slightly updated version of his father's 1751 map, which includes what was part of Virginia then, uh, what is now West Virginia, Kentucky, uh, and also includes much of Pennsylvania, the Ohio River Valley, uh, goes west to the Mississippi River and beyond. Uh, it doesn't cover the Atlantic, uh, doesn't touch on the Atlantic Ocean, doesn't include New England and its shipping ports at all. Uh, and uh, Jefferson pays almost no attention to that part of America. He instead goes west of the Mississippi, which was then the western boundary of the United States describes the Missouri River. Uh, and then he tells you how many miles separate Santa Fe and Mexico City. Uh, he actually gets that just about right. Uh, it's sort of amazing. Uh, so for Hamilton, the ocean trade lanes were the key to the nation's economic and strategic growth. Uh, to Jefferson, the vast spaces beyond the Blue Ridge were to be filled with rectangular townships to be inhabited by deferential yeoman farmers insulated from urban and commercial uh, corruption. So uh, conflict over issues was inevitable. Jefferson opposed Hamilton's national bank, his assumption of state debts, his encouragement of commercial credit and trade with Britain, and was hurt when Washington came down on Hamilton's side each time. Jefferson was not as brilliant a lawyer as Hamilton, a scientist less original than Franklin, a political theorist less acute than Madison, a military leader like Washington or his father, not at all. But he was a wonderful master of words, of pithy phrases. We can see why if John Adams nominated Washington as commander of the Continental Army, he deferred quietly to Jefferson to draft the Declaration of Independence. Uh, we, so we got we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed with their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Try writing something as good as that uh, in your spare time. Uh, if you have a lifetime to do it, you may or may not get there. Uh, this was an artist with words. Uh, and uh, with those words, uh, Jefferson also, I think, as Lincoln recognized, uh, made the end of slavery an inevitable part of the American story. Uh, you really cannot uh, uh, call, you can really not square those words with the continued issues of slavery. And in the 1850s, some of the uh, politicians from the, sub the Southern states are saying out loud, Jefferson was wrong. Well, my view, he was right. and. Uh, Nobody else said it better. Um, as president himself, we know Jefferson was not reluctant to borrow Washington's methods. He required written reports from highly able cabinet members while depending on his own charm and vast range of knowledge to rally his own party members while mollifying the opposition. Um, Alexander Hamilton at age 18 left behind a hellish existence on the slave colony of Sugar Island of St. Croix, never talking about it at all, apparently, except to family members, never expressing a desire to return. He left it behind, uh, never to return, never to refer to. He was always ready to argue, to declaim, to risk his life and ultimately lose it in a needless duel. Jefferson, at age 14, when his father died, inherited wealth, which left him free to do exactly what he liked to spend his time working hard each day, scheduling and learning as much about his subjects, as sub, many subjects as he can pack in each day for the rest of his life, another 69 years, and to retreat 
when he met setbacks to the house he set inconveniently, not on a riverbank like other Virginia houses, but on the top of a little mountain, Monticello, a house he constantly tore down and redesigned. When he moved his wife into a version of Monticello, there was only one room that had a roof where he put the piano forte that he had bought for her from, uh, from France uh, and set up there he, uh, that he ordered there. Uh, he, uh, he always, he created this. So uh, in the, his White House, he created for eight years another Monticello, appearing almost never in public, dressed in ostentatiously modest clothing, charming his carefully selected dinner guests with French cuisine and wine and cultivated a uh, decidedly non-political conversation. In his final version of Monticello, he displayed in the front hall Indian artifacts that Lewis and Clark brought back from the expedition far to the west to which he had ordered them to undertake. But he himself only ventured once or twice west of the Blue Ridge, never as far west as his father Peter Jefferson had gone. Uh, and Joshua Fry did on their surveying trip uh, when they published the map that they published when he was eight years old. So uh, he, he, he always insisted, by the way, that it was Lewis's exp expedition. Lewis was a family friend from Albemarle County. Uh, Lewis, of course, had Cl treated Clark as a complete e equal on this exhibition, on the expedition, but uh, Jefferson never acknowledged this. Uh, he was loyal to the things. And uh, he was, he, he, he created the house that, uh, uh, that it, 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 my views to, to Monticello, the house was really inconvenient for everybody but Jefferson. He gets the best rooms. He gets the rooms with high ceilings. The guests are on the second corner, uh, on the corridor upstairs with small windows and low ceilings. Uh, the slaves are out of sight down below. Uh, he's, uh, he's creating a wonderful place for himself and for his maps and his gadgets. Um, the, the historian Forrest MacDonald has a wonderful phrase about Jefferson, of whom he's not a total fan. He says Jefferson would guide everybody around him to, uh, uh, to help them in their lives. He would provide gentle but firm guidance, uh, helping them achieve whatever they wanted to achieve. He said all he asked in return was total devotion, and he got it. Uh, Lewis and Clark on their expedition up the river on the Missouri River, the Missouri River that Jefferson had described without ever coming within hundreds of miles of seeing it, came to a point in Montana where it seemed to split into three tributaries. They named them the Jefferson, the Madison, and the Gallatin, after the president and the two men who served all eight years of his two terms as Secretary of State and Secretary of the Treasury. Madison is known today as the member of the convention who did the most to shape the Constitution and also wrote the only notes of its proceedings and as president during the War of 1812. Gallatin, far less famous, was Secretary of the Treasury for 13 years in the Jefferson and Madison administration and was a key negotiator in the Treaty of Ghent that ended that war in 1814, where his, uh, he mended uh, arguments between his two younger colleagues um, uh, John Quincy Adams and uh, Henry Clay. John Quincy Adams would get up at five o'clock in the morning to read his Bible, to study one of the seven languages that he learned, uh, and to prepare himself for the day. At 5 a.m., Henry Clay came in from playing cards and drinking whiskey uh, in the course of the evening and making quite a ruckus as he went to bed. So this was uh, Gallatin had certain diplomatic qualities that were there. Uh, these two political allies had backgrounds almost as different as Jefferson's and Madison's uh, and Hamilton's. Madison was born on his family's plantation, a day's horse ride from Jefferson, the oldest of 17 children whose mother lived to be 97 years old. And if you go to uh, Montpelier, one of the things you find is that Madison creates the, a barrier in the center of the house. This really becomes two houses because the father lives long enough to see Madison become Secretary of State. The mother lives 10 years after he's out, he's left the office of president. 
Uh, he's well into the second half of his 70s when she dies. So, and he's got siblings running all around the territory and so forth. Uh, Gallatin, on the other hand, came from a prominent family in stony commercial Geneva, Switzerland. He was orphaned as a child. At 19, he sailed to America and used his inheritance to buy land and build a house on the Monongahela River frontier, Western Pennsylvania. Both had serious politic, uh, intellectual influences. Gallatin from his family's friend, Fred Voltaire in Geneva's Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Madison from Princeton's president, John Witherspoon, educated in the Scottish University's Enlightenment tradition. And of course, in the 18th century, it was the Scottish universities which were the most advanced intellectual uh, universities in the English-speaking world. The British universities were a uh, class for young men to like to drink and ride horses. Uh, the Scottish universities had real scholars. Um, and Madison began uh, a lifetime friendship and political alliance with Thomas Jefferson in the 1780s. And in the 17, summer of 1786, in a small room on the second floor of the crowded family mansion, Montpelier, he studied in books that Jefferson sent over from Paris, accounts of and reflections on republics ancient and modern in preparation for the Constitutional Convention. From the Scottish philosopher David Hume, he developed its theory that a geographically large republic could be held together by a limited government in which each branch checked and balanced each of the others. Madison saw the Republic's geographic expansion as desirable, and he focused on the Southwest. 1780s and 1790s, he worked for free American navigation on the Mississippi River and access to New Orleans. He fought the Confederation government's Secretary of Foreign Affairs, John Jay, who said, well, we can just leave that to the Spanish. We're not going to have American settlers there for 20 years or so. Madison, oh no, said Madison. We got access to it right now. We got Virginians moving to Kentucky. They got to take stuff down the river. So uh, he was doing that as Secretary of State in 1803. He rejoiced at the Louisiana Purchase, was not troubled by the sort of constitutional qualms that Jefferson had about it, which he managed to extinguish fairly rapidly. Um, and in 1811, he ordered U.S. troops to occupy the disputed territory of West Florida along the Gulf of Mexico. It's from Pensacola west to Baton Rouge. Uh, it's the only uh, American part of continental U.S. that the United States obtained by a, not by treaty, but by a uh, uh, the president ordering troops in. Uh, that was uh, James Madison, the theoretical guy, the small man who didn't seem to be physically threatening. In fact, was a pretty tough hombre and uh, got that territory in that way. Uh, as commander in chief in the War of 1812, he was not able to add territory from British Canada, but he ordered Andrew Jackson into his successful uh, defeats of the Creek Indians in Alabama. Uh, and this was against military advice and, and against the British in New Orleans. Gallatin's role was to arrange the financing of these policies uh, and with, his con with, with other fellow immigrants, two of the major financiers that bought up the bonds that paid for the War of 1812, uh, Gallatin arranged, uh, John Jacob Astor in New York and Stephen Girard in Philadelphia, from, respectively from Germany, what is now Germany and France. Uh, Gallatin, uh, and Gallatin gets the idea of what the British are going to settle by informal contacts with Alexander Baring of the Baring Brothers Bank in London that he's maintaining even during the war period. Uh, he had his way around in finance. Uh, and uh, Gallatin's role, uh, and with his contacts in Europe, but his orientation always to the West, uh, Gallatin tended to blend the policies of Jefferson and Hamilton. Uh, he draws up at Jefferson's behest a transportation plan, a mental map for the whole country that includes a bunch of crossings of the Appalachian Trails, including in upstate New York, anticipating the Erie Canal, uh, includes 20th century projects that, uh, uh, that including the Intercoastal Waterway and Interstate 95. Uh, this is Gallatin in 1807. Uh, and in his 70s and 80s, he starts to compile the first dictionary of American Indian languages. Quite a guy.
as I look back on what I've learned in writing about the mental maps of these great men, three observations stand out. One is that the founders were very much aware of the religious, cultural, ethnic, and racial diversity of the 13 colonies and the young republic. For that reason, they purposely created a government with limited powers and countervailing checks and balances uh, to adapt to a large republic. Second, by embarking on a revolution, by proclaiming that all men were created equal with inalienable rights of life, liberty, and property, they undermined the institution of slavery and turned their own minds against it. State legislatures and courts decreed gradual abolition of slavery in New England and Pennsylvania in the 1780s, uh, in the Republic of Vermont in 1777, in New York in 1799, and then that perpetual laggard New Jersey in 1804. Uh, George Washington, conscious in his private life as he was in his public career, not only resigned as commander in chief in 1783, and relinquished the presidency in 1797, but also liberated his slaves in his will. Pardon me for a second. Finally, in my third observation, think of all how contingent all this was. Some years ago, I wrote a book about the events that are known as the Glorious Revolution of 1688-89, which I called Our First Revolution. One of its results of the ouster of King James II and the installation of William and Mary, a series of events that could have failed to occur if any one of dozens of contingencies had not fallen into place, is the reversal of James's policy of abolishing the colonial legislatures. It was in and around these elective assemblies that Franklin and Washington and Jefferson and dozens of other founders had their schooling in political philosophy and in practical politics. And what if Lord Fairfax had not won his case in the Privy Council and never had the occasion to hire George Washington to survey his lands beyond the Blue Ridge? An experience which made this man of unbending Cincinnatian character the plausible commander of the Continental Army and leading citizen of the New Republic. It was often then and sometimes is now hard to resist the thought that a creator was looking out for the success of the American Revolution. Whether or not you share what Washington in his 1783 resignation speech called my gratitude for the interposition of providence, we should be grateful that we Americans are the lucky beneficiaries of the founders' work and for the contributions made by their various mental maps. Thank you very much.